I will call this meeting to order. It's the regularly scheduled meeting of the Transportation and Public Works Committee uh, this day, September 17, 2019. I'm Councilman Reich. I chair the committee and I'm joined by my colleagues, Council Members Johnson, Palmasano, Bender, Fletcher, and Gordon. And we are a quorum and we'll proceed with today's agenda uh, on which we have 23 items. Uh, we have a few public hearings, a discussion item, remainder are consent. I will go through the consent items. Uh, we can pull any item, and I will note that we will be pulling four for a, a minor amendment. Item four is the Congress uh, for a new urbanism legacy project letter for support for Chicago Lake Transit Center Mobility Hub. Item five is the West Broadway Improvement Special Service District 2019 Operating Plan and Budget Amendment. Six is the non-governmental tax exempt parcel street light operation uh, and street maintenance assessment cancellations. Seven is the public right-of-way declaration for 22 Glenwood Avenue North. Eight is the industrial boulevard multi-use trail between I-35W and Broadway Street Northeast, acquisition of permit and temporary easements. Nine is the contract amendment with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for I-35W Lake Street Transit Access Project. Ten is the contract amendment with Hennepin County for pedestrian street lighting along Penn Avenue North. Eleven is a contract amendment uh, with Afnatech Incorporated for the Minneapolis Parking Integrated Video Management System. Twelve is the contract amendment with Metro Transit for uh, Route 5 Transit Signal Priority. Thirteen is the cooperative review with Hennepin County for the traffic signals and underground fiber optic si traffic signal interconnect cable. Fourteen is the cooperative agreement with Minnesota Ballpark Authority for pedestrian street lighting on 5th Avenue North and Washington Avenue North and 5th Street North. 15 is the zombie pub crawl large block event permit. That event will take place October 12, 2019. Uh, item 16 is the West Broadway Avenue Theater Worth Parkway intersection reconstruction project, and that's the layout approval. 17 is the Southwest Wyndham residential street reconstruction project layout and easement. 18 is the Hoyer Heights, uh, which is Wade Park residential street reconstruction project designation cost estimate and setting that public hearing, which will be November 12. 19 is the Hennepin Avenue project uh, from Washington Avenue to 12th Street reconstruction. Also the project designation, cost estimate, and that public hearing will also, oh, no, that'll be October 29th. 20 is the repair of street failure, uh, 90, uh, 7th Street South, uh, project designation, cost estimate, and setting that public hearing for October 29th. Item 21 is the bid for removal of snow and ice on public sidewalks. 22 is the bid for electrical vehicle charging uh, stations project. Uh, does anyone wish to pull any item? See none, I will pull item four. There's an amendment, uh, an inclusion of um, the importance of cultural districts and works like this. Um, it's been vetted um, and I will move uh, amending item four thusly. Is there any discussion on that? See none, all of approval of the amendment, say aye. aye. And then, all move, uh, and then I will move all items on the consent. Uh, all in approval, say aye. 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 Dissenting name. Those items carry. We can now move to the public hearing. Uh, good morning, Director Hutchinson. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I would like to recognize the effort that went into this very large uh, agenda for today, the effort on the part of staff. Thanks very much to you all. Uh, it's a volume of work. Uh, today we've got um, three public hearings, the first of which is the West Broadway Improvement Special Service District 2020 Proposed Services and Service Charges. The information will be presented by Andrew Carlson. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Andrew Carlson. I'm the Project Manager for Special Service Districts. I'm going to briefly uh, just provide a background about service districts and then we'll get into uh, West Broadway and then the next public hearing will be uh, for the 428. 428A districts followed by the DID. Uh, simply put, a uh, special service district allows property owners in a commercial area to collectively impose service charges on themselves each year to create a pool of funds. These funds are directed back to the district in the form of enhanced services and special amenities. The enhanced services and special amenities are over and above what the city ordinarily provides. Each special service district is guided by an advisory board that's composed of property owners or their representative within the district. Each advisory board recommends the services, service frequencies, estimated budget, and service charge methodology for their district. SSD service charges are paid via the regular property tax statements issue, issued by Hennepin County. The funds are then transferred from the county to the city. Uh, those funds are used to procure the services described in their annual work plan and budget. The City of Minneapolis Department of Public Works or the district's management entity, in the case of a self-managed district, uh, implements the recommended services, 
most often which are uh, bid competitively through uh, third-party private vendors. <clears throat> The city provides all advisory board administration, procurement services, contract management, and vendor performance monitoring. Advisory board members are also monitoring the service delivery throughout the year to ensure that services are meeting the expectations of the property owners in each district. In short, SSDs are a highly effective public-private partnership that makes significant annual investments towards improving and maintaining the city's public right-of-way. Uh, any general questions with regards to service districts? This all sounds familiar? Okay, moving forward. Uh, the first one we have is the West Broadway Business and Area, I'm sorry, the West Broadway uh, Improvement Special Service District, which was established back in 2015 uh, when property owners within the district wanted to promote a cleaner, greener West Broadway business district. Earlier this year, the City Council amended Minneapolis Code of Ordinances, Chapter 434, to readopt the ordinance to renew the WBID with uh, a new sunset provision set for December 31st, 2024. As the BID enters its sixth year of operations in 2020, day-to-day -day operations of the district services will transition from the West Broadway Business and Area Coalition, who is its current district, man district management entity, to the Department of Public Works. City representatives have worked closely with the WBC to help ensure a seamless transition of district services. As part of this transition, it is envisioned that the City Council will, before the start of next year, adopt a five-member advisory board to help guide the WBID. The appointment of an advisory board would match the governance structure used in the other 14 city-managed special service districts. The proposed WBID 2020 operating plan and budget was developed by staff in consultation with the WBC board. The service charges will be collected on the 2020 real estate taxes in the same manner as special assessments, each affected property owner was mailed a notice of public hearing. With that notice, uh, that notice was sent 10 days in advance of today's public hearing. I should also mention, with, uh, in addition to that, they also received a copy of their 2020 operating plan and budget. Staff therefore recommends the passage of a resolution approving the 2020 operating plan and budget, special services, cost estimates, service charges, and list of service charges for the coming year in the West Broadway Improvement Special Service District and directing the Department of Public Works to proceed with the work. That concludes my comments. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the staff presentation? Um, seeing none, I will then open the public hearing. Uh, we do have one person signed in, uh, Thomas Johnson. Uh, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Hi, um, Thomas Johansson. I am a property owner, business owner, operator on West Broadway. Um, and um, I post this, I, I think it's one more um, a continuing expense. I commend the effort of the public-private partnership and the improvement uh, activities in business. When things don't work and it's expensive, you have to stop doing it. And in this case, putting it on um, city government, I'm afraid it just continues and then it's an added burden and tax expense that goes on and on and on. And, leave a lot of businesses uh, less competitive. And so the whole purpose is to improve the environment, a uh, business environment, environment for everyone. I, I, what I've read and understood from this, this is not the way to do it. There's already duplicate uh, uh, waste disposals. Um, there are initially good ideas, but um, I didn't work. So I, I think this would be a good time to um, commend the effort, but uh, discontinue. So I post. Thank, Thank you for that comment. Anyone else sign in? Uh, anyone else wish to come forward and speak to this matter? Anyone else wish to come forward? Um, seeing none, I close the public hearing. Um, note the objections. Of course, there's always work to be done. I know there's a transitional moment here, uh, which we can reflect on um, uh, improvements that speak to the gentleman's testimony. Uh, with that, I will move the item before us. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Dissenting name. That carries, we can now move to item two. Okay, item number two. Mr. Chairman and council members, uh, just for clarification purposes, 428A refers to Minnesota state statute which grants municipalities the authority to establish special service districts by local ordinance. All the special service, service districts before you today were established under state statute 428A. Uh, as a note, uh, we'll be back before you on October 15th to present our legacy districts. 
uh, those, of course, predate the 428A statute. So uh, you'll be seeing us again in about a month. But for today, we have the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, and the Lindale Lake Special Service District seeking approval of their 2020 proposed services and service charges. Back in June, uh, Public Works staff worked with each district's advisory board to recommend the services, prepare estimated budgets, and to review their estimated methodologies for the coming year. These service charges would be collected on their 2020 real estate taxes in the same manner as special assessments. Each affected property owner was mailed a notice of public hearing with the service charge amount 10 days in advance of the public hearing. Staff therefore recommends passage of the resolution approving the 2020 operating plan and budget, service charges, cost estimates, co uh, service charges, and list of service charges for the coming year for the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, and Lindale Lake Special Service Districts, and directing the Department of Public Works to proceed with the work. Uh, just lastly, as a note, um, the combined budget cost estimate for these districts, for, including West Broadway, is over $700,000 in public investment within the Minneapolis public right-of-way. Uh, so it truly is um, uh, working with the public-private partnership we see through our special service districts. With that, that concludes my presentation, and happy to stand for any questions. Any questions per the staff presentation? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing. Anyone signed in? No one signed in. Does anyone wish to come forward? Anyone wish to come forward? Seeing no one coming forward, I will close the uh, public hearing and move the item before us. Is there any further discussion? See none, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, dissenting name, uh, and that carries. And we can now go to our final um, public Thank hearing. And I believe Mr. We'll Chair, members of the committee, uh, Brett Gently will present this next item. This is the uh, public hearing for the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District 2020 Proposed Services and Service Charges. This includes cost estimates, service charges, list of service services provided for the Improvement District. Um, I want to note we have many of our downtown partners in the room, and I thank you for being here today. Brett. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Brett Jelly. I'm a Deputy Director in Public Works. I'm in front of you this morning to introduce the public hearing for the 2020 services and service charges for the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District, which is also known as the DID. This is an annual public hearing that is required as part of the City Council's review and approval of the district's proposed services and service charges uh, for 2020. The DID was established in uh, by Minneapolis Code of Ordinances in December of 2008 and began full service in July of 2009. The district was renewed in 2013 and most recently in 2017. Each year, the DID's board made up of downtown property owners, employers, residents, and leaders establishes a budget for accomplishing their goals of making downtown Minneapolis clean, green, safe, and vibrant. Public hearing notices and the proposed operating plan were mailed to all ratepayers. The DID hosted an open house on September 3rd. The open house was advertised in a number of locations, including all of the hearing notices on the, the DID's website and in their pop-up office. The proposed 2020 service charges are $7,295,657. It's always a hard number to read. Uh, this represents a 4.5% increase over the 2019 budget. I'd also like to note that the city clerk should have uh, roughly 10 uh, letters of support on file and available for your review. And with that, I would like to introduce Steve Kramer, the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District to give some highlights for their 2020 service plan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for letting me make a few comments. I think I had a couple of slides, and I don't know how to work your system. Do I? How does that work? Oh, there we go. So the first is just to indicate that, uh, yes, smiling face of Councilmember Fletcher. This is our 10th year anniversary. So thank you, Councilmember Fletcher and Councilmember Goodman, for helping us celebrate by reading a proclamation from Mayor Fry. So we covered all the bases there. Um, but we're, we're delighted that, that the DID has been around for 10 years and I think has really made a difference in the quality of life of, of downtown and as a result had a positive impact on 
on all of uh, all of Minneapolis. <clears throat> Just quickly, here are some uh, to break down the seven point two nine five six seven five, a number that is not easy to say, Brett. Uh, in terms of activity areas, you can see here the the areas of focus for for DID. I mean, the watchwords always are clean, green, safe, and and active. And I guess I would probably be remiss given the prominence that public safety has had in our community, particularly this year. Uh, you know, a big part of our investment is in public safety. So we see ourselves as a partner with, uh, with the city and with MPD and with everyone who contributes to the safety of our, of our downtown community. So a lot of that money is certainly direct law enforcement, but some of it also is in uh, other, other strategies that are part of a, of a safety, uh, safety program for our city. And then the, the next line item kind of relates to safety, which is the investment that we've made in livability services. We've created our own livability team by repurposing some of the ambassadors to really zero in on kind of downtown homelessness and some of the issues that are attendant to that, to that situation. I would just note that there is a national conference in town this right now, Monday through Wednesday, of organizations like DID from all across the country to zero in specifically on that topic because it is such a prominent issue and such a challenge for, for downtowns all across the country. I was just with a group from Austin with Nuria talking about this issue because it's a, and I know Council President Bender was speaking with them earlier because it's a challenge that they face as well. So we're trying to be a constructive partner along with many others to address that issue. And then the third point I would make is just generally speaking over the 10 years, the DID has uh, tried to be nimble and kind of react and evolve as our downtown has, has evolved. So just in the last couple of years, a, a few of the initiatives, we created a Nicollet, a Nicollet, a Nicollet Mall address, which will now be a permanent office for some of our staff where we do many of the activation strategies. Uh, we've worked with MPD and Metro Transit Police on buyback during the, during the summer as part of the uh, 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 summer safety program. Activation strategies created a maker's market to complement the farmer's market, street show, curated musicians. Again, Councilmember Fletcher has been a featured performer at times. Worked with Zamea uh, Theater to kind of bring that resource to our downtown community for educational purposes. Created Nicollet Tours. Uh, new strategies for cleaning, uh, new equipment, uh, co uh, partnerships with the library for a library uh, mobile cart that can bring reading to, to downtown uh, uh, folks. Relationship with Minnesota Fringe for th uh, performances at Theater in the Round, which will be opening. Kind of the barriers will go down a little bit later this month. Uh, collaboration with MinSpin and some recent pilot projects around the public, uh, public re restroom challenge in downtown of a storage pilot project, again, addressing some of the homelessness conditions, and then working with Councilmember Fletcher's office on the possibility, we haven't solved it yet, but the possibility of, again, repurposing some of the ambassadors to be a very late night resource for people who might be vulnerable in that environment, freeing up law enforcement to really zero in on the issues that they need to pay attention to. So over the 10 years, and especially in these last couple of years, as things have really been dynamic downtown, DID's uh, worked to with many of our partners in the room, with our partners in City Hall to continue to make downtown an extraordinary downtown, and we hope to continue that for the, for the coming decade as well. Thank you, happy to answer any questions, but I know there are a lot of people here who want to comment as well. Thank you, and thanks for that overview. Any questions for that presentation? Uh, seeing none. Thanks. We will then uh, open the public hearing. Uh, anyone signed in? We do have some folks signed in. I'll call them in order, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Dan Callison. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Mr. Chairman, Council Members, my name is Dan Collison, Executive Director for the East Town Business Partnership and Executive Director for the New Loop Partners in the Greater North Loop Area. I speak in support of today's budget proposal and plan because the organizations and businesses that I represent constitute two of the most rapidly growing edges of downtown. And in consideration of both the businesses and the residents who value from this program and the budget in the way it's spent. Um, as such, with several hundred businesses and property owners in mind, we are concerned about being remaining intentional in the way our pedestrian right-of-ways are kept clean, safe, and framed by the kind of greening that the DID provides that helps the workforce residents and visitors of downtown Minneapolis feel more vitally connected to one another and to the greening infrastructure. 
The two organizations I represent have submitted letters of support and connection to this hearing because we believe these are critical resources. They're thoughtfully used and strategically applied to a lot of the issues and challenges and opportunities that exist downtown, including collaborating with multiple organizations and institutions to accomplish key annual objectives, innovative activations that are a great value to the public. Uh, they also track property conditions in the public realm and develop key safety initiatives to mitigate serious issues surrounding crime, livability, problem institutions, and also helping those who face homelessness and coordinating public safety concerns with law enforcement. For all these reasons, probably a couple dozen more, we advocate that you approve the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Lewis. Good morning, I'm Kevin Lewis, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Kevin Lewis, the present CEO of BOMA, which is the Building Owners and Managers Association of Greater Minneapolis. Um, and I know that there's quite a bit of support from our organization as a trade association to support the 2020 operating plan and budget. And also there's a number of members of, in the room that come from the commercial real estate industry. Uh, understanding that their buildings provide work uh, place environments for thousands and thousands of workers and and to build the commerce that we enjoy. Also, they're quite the contributor in terms of property tax, as we all know, statewide uh, CI property tax as well. Uh, assessments as we expand the Nicollet Mall and Hennepin and so on, but certainly the DID uh, as an investor in that regard. Uh, we've enjoyed a very clean uh, downtown as the results. Uh, the ambassadors are very friendly, visible, and so on. And some of the things that I've seen growing are the activation components of it. To see a police officer playing chess with the citizen down in, on the Nickel Malls, um, a lot of fun. Um, looking to the future and so on, um, obviously it's been touched on that we're in some rather unique times in terms of public safety, uh, behavior, and so on. And I can't imagine to reverse things if the DID were not in existence right now. You would not see that type of activation. You would not see a friendly accommodating ambassadors around a clean downtown. So as we all together collectively try to stem some of the things that have been happening lately, uh, we can rest assured with the DID's operations and the type of services that they provide for the men and women that work downtown, certainly the residents, visitors, and so on. Uh, I just can't imagine not having them involved. So BOMA supports the DID 2020 uh, operating plan and budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom Whitlock. Uh, <clears throat> Chair, committee members, uh, my name is Tom Whitlock. I uh, am president of Damon Farber Landscape Architects. We own a business in uh, the uh, warehouse district. Uh, I'm here in support of the DID uh, and their work. I, like Kevin, I can't imagine downtown without their presence. Um, I think especially uh, working uh, in the warehouse district uh, with a lot of nightclubs, uh, Cleaning up every morning after that. Uh, I see regularly DID personnel out there cleaning up uh, after a Saturday night uh, in the warehouse district. Uh, and, uh, and I remember what it was like before that. Um, and so the DID is critically important when it comes to cleaning. Uh, greening, uh, very important. Uh, not only the annual things that they do uh, on First Avenue within the warehouse district, uh, but really their partnership with Public Works uh, on building our canopy downtown uh, is, has really been transformational, I think, uh, and really important to the future of creating a livable downtown with all of our new residents. So uh, the greening is critically important. Uh, and then obviously safety, just to keep pounding on that, uh, that's really important and it is a partnership and I think the DID plays an important role with all of the other uh, partners on that. Uh, so I'm here uh, in support of the DID. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else sign in? Um, <clears throat> anyone else wish to come forward and make comment? Anyone else wish to come forward? Uh, seeing none, I will close the public hearing um, and I will yield the floor to Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude for the work that the DID does. I think that they 
uh, the public testimony here has talked a lot about several of the roles that they play that I think are critically important from maintaining some of the public realm and uh, the public art along Nicolette Mall and a lot of the um, just, you know, critical things that make our city uh, a great place to be. I think the multitude of uses of downtown creates challenges that DID is problem solving and figuring out ways to make uh, to make work every day and uh, some of the behind the scenes work that people don't always see, some of the coordination that they've done, the uh, um, uh, coordinating a bar link so that uh, all of the nightlife operators are communicating with each other and uh, some of the work that they do with MPD behind the scenes around maintaining uh, some of the cameras and some of the other work that uh, that happens that's been critical to our overall public safety approach, I think, uh, is really valuable and is something that we need to um, continue supporting. And uh, you know, just a preview for everybody. Uh, you know, Steve kind of previewed it, but but we'll be talking about uh, maybe some things even in addition to this to really think about how extending some of the ambassador role that it has been so good in identifying things on the front end uh, sometimes when we can see uh, uh, some negative activity starting to form uh, we've got these great eyes on the street who can tell us what's going on and help us troubleshoot um, so we've been at least talking about whether that could be uh, in addition to our late night approach as well and I think you know we're that's something we'll we'll try in a pilot and sort of see if we can make work but I think there's a lot of uh, potential to continue um, they've just been a critical partner in troubleshooting when something goes wrong and trying to think through sort of how do we approach this and what are the, what are the different tools we can bring to bear to, uh, to solve problems together. And I'll just tell you, my constituents who live just outside of the DID boundaries uh, are constantly asking if we can get those services extended a little further out and a little further out so uh, uh, people see the positive impact that it has. So I'm happy to support this and I'll uh, move approval if it's okay. Oh, absolutely. It's been moved uh, for approval. Uh, any further discussion? Um, I will, will comment, uh, you know, all the districts that we work on, big, like the DAD and small, uh, maybe a stretch of Central or West Broadway, um, all sort of take that notion that there's a place there that we care about and uh, we take a collective effort in, in that care and so I think they all have that commonality and just as we couldn't imagine downtown without DID, I don't think we could imagine our streets, our main streets without our legacy uh, smaller but, but equally important uh, efforts. So. Uh, kudos to staff and the partnerships that are out there. Uh, with that, all in favor say aye. 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 Dissenting name. That carries. And now we can move to the discussion item. Uh, Director Hutchinson. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, our final item today is a discussion item and is a receiving and filing of an overview of the draft Minneapolis Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, I want to start by saying that this began with you in 2017 when you showed leadership collectively, all in support of a resolution that turns to a policy. Um, you supported this again when you approved budget for staff to lead this effort, and you approved budget to create this plan, and we went and hired the best. And your support has been uh, felt by the team um, all along. Today, we are uh, presenting to you the culmination of over a year's worth of work. Um, I want to acknowledge um, members of our Vision Zero task force. Velma Corbel was here. Unfortunately, she told me she had to go right at 1030, and she did go right at 1030. Um, Velma was here representing the Vision Zero task force, which consisted of uh, most of the department heads of the city. And you know what? They came to all the meetings, and they actually reviewed all our stuff and contributed and gave us great advice along the way. I also want to recognize that we have the chair of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, Abigail, Abigail Johnson, Abigail Johnson, um, who participated in the Advisory Committee, which was a team of about 30 people that gave us input along the way. And the Vision Zero Technical Advisory Committee was an interdisciplinary team within the city, uh, folks like Don Elwood and Steve Mosing and Kathleen Mayel and Paul Mogish and Sarah McKenzie, uh, who all and, and others who all participated to, to shape this plan. Um, I feel uh, proud of the work, uh, proud of the work that Ethan and the entire team has done. And without going any further, I'm going to ask Ethan to provide you with that overview. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Wright. Good morning. My name is Ethan Foley. I'm the Vision Zero Program Coordinator for the city. And today I'm going to share a brief overview of the draft Vision Zero Action Plan. I'm going to share just a little bit of the context, get into some of the engagement details that we heard for that informed this draft plan, um, share some of the, the 
key highlights of strategies and actions, and then share where we're going next. So just as a reminder, our, our goal and our commitment is to get to zero traffic deaths and severe injuries on our streets by 2027. To give you a sense of context for the work we have to do, uh, over 10 years we saw an average of 11 people were killed and 84 people were severely injured in cr uh, traffic crashes on, on streets in Minneapolis that doesn't include the interstate system. Those are numbers, I just wanna note that those are lives, and these are people, their families, forever impacted. I want to recognize those names with this graphic um, to really put a, a little bit more of a face behind those numbers. And I just want to say, you know, this impacts all of us, and we hope that we can get down to zero so we uh, have fewer families face the pain that these families did. So as um, uh, Robin mentioned, we had started this process in September of 2017 with a commitment. Um, we wanted this effort to be grounded in great data and great engagement. And that was part of the commitment. And so we finished up our pedestrian crash study, our Vision Zero crash study, and we've done really good engagement, coordinated with the Transportation Action Plan to uh, help inform uh, this process, and then we've had great support from committees, as Robin mentioned as well. So we're at the point now of releasing a draft plan, and we'll be back soon for a final plan. So just a reminder, the interdisciplinary part of this is critical. We cannot achieve Vision Zero without a multifaceted approach that includes our internal departments um, across many areas and partnerships with the county, MnDOT, our community stakeholders, and our residents. Um, and so I'm so happy that we had great participation and ownership from uh, many uh, folks internally and externally on this process. I also want to just note that we haven't We've been making strides already on Vision Zero. Uh, this past legislative session, we got uh, all cities got authority to set speed limits, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. We also, uh, shortly after our Vision Zero commitment, uh, striped uh, new zebra crosswalks, which is a um, best practice um, in vis improving visibility, and we've done that all across our city systematically. Um, and we've been incorporating Vision Zero thinking and our, our traffic safety data analysis into our prioritization and planning for all of our capital projects. So there's been a lot of work happening. Um, now to talk about the plan and you know what's what's in here and where did this come from? So we, you heard at the last TBW meeting an update on the engagement around the transportation action plan. As I mentioned, our engagement for Vision Zero up to this point has been wholly coordinated with the transportation action plan. I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that were directly related feedback we received for Vision Zero and traffic safety through that process. Um, that included 101 different engagement activities. We did on the street intercept surveys and online surveys. We wanted to make sure we heard from folks where um, most crashes are happening. Um, overall, with uh, around traffic safety and Vision Zero issues, we engaged more than 3,000 people over the last 14 months. Um, I, I note these pictures on the screen here. We did an activity which I'll, I'll highlight some of the responses to around having people share their best safety idea and we, get, we got really amazing ideas, which is great. So one of the, we asked people how important it was to improve traffic safety on our streets, and overwhelmingly people, 85%, said very important, um, which is, I think, a little higher than maybe we even ex expected, and I, show, I think shows the interest in this topic. We also asked people how safe they feel today, and you can see here that uh, a you know, slight majority say somewhat safe, and then we also see some people saying not very safe. So opportunities for improvement, you know, we're, I think that reflects our data. We're doing pretty well, but we have opportunities to do better. We also asked people if you could choose two areas that the city should focus on around improving traffic safety, what would they be? And I want to highlight the top three here, building uh, additional street safety improvements, slowing down cars and trucks to safer speeds, and improving enforcement of traffic laws like speeding and red light running. So those were consistent themes we heard people prioritizing throughout our engagement. Um, and we did also hear some people would say, you need to do all these things. And I think that's, that, that we know that's true, and also how do we prioritize. 
So here's a word cloud of the responses to the my best safety idea question. So this is uh, the frequency that a word was used in those responses. And we definitely heard a lot of things around street design and operations and improving enforcement in a variety of ways. And those were real themes within that as well. So for the draft action plan, um, I, I want to highlight some of the foundational principles that we had to creating this work and then guide our ongoing Vision Zero work as well. So safety is human life first is really saying we need to move rapidly because we can save lives and we need to save lives. Equity, we see disparities in traffic crashes today. People in low-income neighborhoods, people um, who walk and bike, our Native American residents are disproportionately impacted by tra traffic crashes. And we want to recognize those inequities and then and work to address them while also making sure through our work in Vision Zero that we aren't having unintended consequences um, in other areas for, related to equity. Um, our effort is intended to be data driven. That includes both our crash data, but also data in other forms. The community feedback we get is really important part of that as well. And accountability, I just wanna stress how important it is across all of this plan that we are building trust and with our community because we need to do it together. And so that's a lot about transparency, engagement, um, and evaluation and, and tracking our work. All right, so our strategies and actions in the draft plan are in four areas. Safe street strategies, those are our street design, infrastructure, operations, things in the street that we can do to improve safety. Um, and these strategies build on our many, many years of, of this work. Uh, and safe people strategies, really looking at um, how we support safe human behavior and choices on our streets uh, and, and with communications, education, and enforcement efforts. Safe vehicles, uh, we are not the federal government, and so the city's role in vehicle safety is different. And so we wanted to recognize that. I'm not going to highlight things here, but just want to note that we do have a role to play, especially with new technologies coming on our streets and making sure that we're um, managing those safely and effectively, and also with our city fleet. So we're looking at some things there. And then safety data. So it's, improved, uh, it's important that we continue to improve, enhance our, the data that we have coming in to help us prioritize decision making. So I'm not going to highlight things there today either, but that's an important component of our plan too. All right, in the safe streets area, I'm just going to highlight a few things that I think are going to be most, uh, get the most attention and most noteworthy for folks and important strategies in our plan. Uh, so we are proposing to reduce speed limits on, on our streets, um, and this is because we know that that will save lives. Uh, higher traffic speeds increase, make it harder for somebody to stop, so increase the likelihood of crashes. And as this graphic on the screen shows, increases the likelihood that a crash will uh, be deadly or, or um, lead to a severe injury. And that is especially true for uh, people walking. So I, I want to note, I noted earlier that we, uh, the city got authority to be able to set our speed limits. We're currently in the process of analyzing that and coordinating with our partners like the city of St. Paul um, and uh, anticipate bringing new speed limits um, next year. Okay, we're also in, uh, proposing to make safety improvements proactively on our high injury streets. Uh, and so our high injury streets are the 9% of our streets on this map that they carry 34% of the traffic, so they do have a lot of going on there, but they have 70% of our severe and fatal crashes over 10 years. And these streets, it's really important for this strategy that we are coordinating with our partners at the county in MnDOT because the city owns a number of these streets and the county in MnDOT also own a number of these streets. So when we're talking about what are we doing in the, the period of this plan, 2020 to 2022, we're really looking at how we can move rapidly um, and most efficiently to address as much of that those high injury streets as possible. Um, so that includes using paint uh, for things like four to three lane conversions, like we see in, in this picture, a proven safety measure that on our last 11 four to three lane conversions that have been done in the city from the county or the city, we saw a 36% reduction in injury crashes before and after. Um, we also can uh, 
do things at intersections where most of our crashes are happening to improve the visibility uh, of folks and help to, to moderate uh, turning speeds because we see a lot of crashes happen with turns and those are things we can do with bollards and paint as well. So the, the bollards, the plastic posts in this picture for to do things like bump outs or pedestrian medians or other things to raise that visibility and reduce um, conflicts between different types of users on our streets. In addition to that, um, we are <clears throat> updating our street design guide. This is being done as part of our transportation action plan. And as part of that effort, we are coordinating in Vision Zero best practices and thinking and this goal as a center part of that work. Um, and that will ensure that as we are building out new streets and responding also to to development happening and utility work and other things in a way that we're incorporating safety improvements wherever we can in our right of way. Um, I want to note oops, one other, uh, a few other things in our safe uh, streets area. So as we're working on our high injury network improvements, we're going to be really intentional about engagement with our community members, especially in ACP 50 areas or areas of concentrated poverty where a majority of residents are people of color. We're going to be really intentional about our communications around those efforts and tying it back and explaining why we're making changes uh, for safety. And then we're going to be evaluating that work um, really intentionally and regularly. Again, this is part of building that trust with community and to, um, to show results and make changes as we need to if we see something's not working as we'd hoped. All right, so again, our safe people area is addressing how are we, what can we do to address human behavior on our street. So this graphic shows the five leading unsafe behaviors on our streets, the things that cause the most severe and fatal crashes in Minneapolis. And those are driving under the influence of, uh, of drugs or alcohol, speeding, distracted driving, uh, red light running, and unsafe turning at intersections, especially involve, uh, often involving um, uh, someone walking or biking getting, getting hit. And so we can address a number of these things with street design, but it's, again, that partnership across the different pillars of safety are really important. So we're looking at an education and communications, prioritizing some things we, can th we think can make a difference, um, expanding access to drivers and bike walk education, I think is a bit longer term strategy, but also an important one for building trust with our community and making sure that we aren't missing folks, which we are, quite frankly, right now in those uh, education efforts. We're also, a number of Vision Zero Cities do a big, expen expensive, um, paid media campaign to educate folks on traffic safety. We're not proposing that scale of a campaign because we want to focus on what we think are the, the most important items, but we are saying that communications is important. We need to be targeting that both with our internal messages that we're already talking about, make sure everything's in line, but also working with community partners around that. We are also been uh, working on some things, strategic things we can do to uh, equitably enforce um, on our streets. And I want to note in this area, I noted earlier that um, we heard a lot of interest uh, from folks around uh, enforcement. We also heard concerns, and I, th I think you all are aware of those, um, and concerns about equity and enforcement. And so we try to be intentional about that as we think uh, about the actions you see on, in this area. Uh, one of the big areas is um, seeking to do automated traffic enforcement. And so it's already on the city's legislative agenda um, to get this uh, 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 clarity of this authority at the legislature. It'll obviously take some work. Um, we also uh, need to study how we do it most effectively and equitably in, uh, in the city. Um, we're <clears throat> looking at focusing enforcement on those leading crash causes that I mentioned. Um, we know that if we can communicate better about what we're enforcing on, that will help us achieve more results from that work. So doing more of that. Um, I want to note we had an action in here around um, evaluating, um, reinstating the Traffic Enforcement Crash Reduction Unit at MPD. Um, and then those equity enforcement measures are also really important. And these things we talked about with the city's attorney's office, uh, um, things like 
can we provide more access to our, our diversion program that takes folks out of the criminal process with, if they get a traffic ticket, give them more opportunities to do, say, a, a safety class instead, um, make some of that process easier. So other things in that realm to um, address some of the concerns we heard as well. All right, so that's a, those are some of the highlights and some things I, I wanted to, to make sure you were aware of. Our next steps for this process are we're accepting pu public comment on the draft plan uh, through October 16th. And we're gonna have an in-person and online open house and we have a website where people can uh, share feedback as well and online forums and all those things. I wanna also just note that the feedback we received through this process will be uh, considered as part of our uh, engagement on the Transportation Action Plan, which will be forthcoming. We'll be back um, as, as soon as we feel comfortable with the changes that we're making based on public comment, um, either late this year or early next year with the final plan. So with that, I, I just wanna say thank you so much for all your leadership on this topic. We're really excited to um, present this plan and get work on engagement, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you for that presentation. In addition to having a full committee here, we also have Councilmember Cano, um, and I believe uh, Councilmember Gordon uh, wishes to address you. Yes, thank you very much, and really appreciate the uh, the presentation and the efforts, and excited to see what strategies we come up with. I was um, a little curious about some of the information, and I know we talked a lot about street improvements. Um, but I know a lot of our biggest accidents happen at um, intersections mm -hmm. and actually happen at signalized intersections. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we talk about red light running and we talk about unsafe turning. And I wanna make sure that when we talk about street improvements, that's including making improvements to how we signal the streets, how we uh, maybe are even being part of the problem sometimes depending on who we say gets to go first according to all the, the signs and if we're trying and experimenting with some innovative ideas I know that I noticed one change at 15th and Como where we actually have a um, everybody walks at the same time now I think we used to call it a scramble or something and when I first got here Public Works thought it was just a crazy idea that I, we'd ever bring it up as one to try. And it kind of works. I mean, cars have to wait and all the pedestrians are going. And uh, um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering about that. Even running the red lights, um, when are they running the red lights? Are they trying to get through at the end of it? Mm -hmm. So do we need more full reds for everybody so that mm -hmm. we don't have that time when it's I don't know if there's, because I actually think the more we can manipulate the environment and change the environment to, to change behavior, the more effective that we're going to be. Um, and other education and enforcement are great, but um, I, it's, it's pretty easy when you make something structurally impossible to do, people aren't going to be able to do it, or and then you, there's gradations below that. I mean, you can respond a little, but maybe I'm especially curious about how well we're studying the intersections and where the accidents happen and how maybe the way we're managing those are having an impact. Uh, Chair and Council Member Gordon, uh, you remember our presentation from January on, the, on our safety data really well. Um, you are correct that uh, a majority of our crashes happen at signalized intersections and over 80% of our crashes happen at intersections. And so intersections are really important for improving safety. Um, this slide includes, um, I have backup slides in case they're needed, um, and this includes some of the, the measures we can do with intersections and uh, signalization. So you, uh, on the top left here is a leading pedestrian interval that we have in Dinky Town um, right now. And so those, it's a proven safety measure. Those are things we can, we're looking at expanding. Um, having dedicated left turn phases is also helps because we see a lot of uh, left turn crashes um, as well. Um, and then there are also measures we can do with, with paint and bollards. Um, as in the top right, this is from New York City. Um, where they've had a lot of Vision Zero success, and a lot of that has been focused on things happening at intersections. So we're being really intentional about that. We have an action particularly related, a strategy and actions related to um, our, our signals and looking at um, incorporating safety and other goals uh, intentionally into that work as well. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I also think people are doing a better job out there um, looking out for pedestrians. And I think part of it is just that we're doing this plan, but maybe it's just the whole culture that's going on. And I think as we've added more pedestrian crossing signals and more even flashing lights and some of these other things, it's letting people know that, um, oh, everybody or the general 
feeling is the pedestrians are really important and so we're going to yield and stop for them more often than maybe we would have in the past. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to thank staff for all of the great work that has gone into this. And I know, um, so I, re I represent a ward where four of the census tracts have the highest per capita crashes and where a lot, which also has a high concentration of the high injury streets. And so mm -hmm. I both appreciate all of the careful work that went into making the case with data about why we need change, but my constituents live it every day. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine most of the feedback coming in this next round will be like what I've been hearing for six years, which is when are we going to get more safety improvements in our community? Um, mm -hmm. So can you help me answer that question for my constituents? I know we have been implementing changes um, as we go. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, having staff come to us and say, we want to do zebra Christ crossings on every single intersection in the city was like, that's the kind of things that my constituents cheer about. Um, and I know that may not be the case across the city, but in places where we're growing really quickly, we're adding thousands of residents, we have high crash volume today. I think the people who live in those communities are anxious for more change in their streets. Sure. So can you talk about how this fits in with the work that's already happening that we heard, but also the transportation action plan? Mm -hmm. And I also just want to make sure that we're planning for the budget that we need to um, make these sa safety and traffic improvements, especially again in places where we already have high population density, high density of um, crashes per capita, high concentration of high injury streets, and we're adding more population to those very um, neighborhoods through our plan which concentrates growth near transit. So I think our constituents are concerned mm -hmm. about the pace of improvement versus pace of population growth for sure. Um, uh, Chair and uh, Council President Bender. Um, so yes, we are being intentional here that we want to uh, make more investments and safety improvements on, our, on these high injury streets and, and to do it rapidly uh, as we can over the next, we're, this is a three year plan. So mo moving quickly, I will note that we're, we started doing more detailed analysis beyond this around what, are, what might be appropriate safety treatments and where might, uh, might those be most appropriate. We also, uh, I think it's online now, that we're hiring a Vision Zero engineer um, as well who will be um, helping us with that work and the detailed work and we'll be uh, getting out and engaging soon on this in more detail and working with community on those changes um, but we we really do hope to address um, hundreds of intersections um, in three years on on these high injury streets um, Maybe just, uh, and thank you. I appreciate that, and I know my constituents will too. I also want to say I really want to commend the department for taking this system-wide view, because I think when we look at things like high injury crash, um, you know, intersections with have, which have high crash rates or corridors like our four-lane arterials all together at once, it sort of takes the conversation out of you know this particular corridor and all of the constraints that we have in. Mm -hmm highly populated urban environments with lots of different pressures on our street system and helps us take, I think taking that citywide view, like how are all of our four lane arterials working? What are the statistics we see when we switch them to three lanes? You know, how can we apply that to, to streets in particular neighborhoods? I think that approach helps us in community talk about you know why change might be needed or what the mm -hmm. benefits might be rather than taking that sort of corridor by corridor approach so i think we'll see a lot of benefit from kind of taking the time to take that citywide view um, so you know all of our constituents are hearing the same thing hearing the same data understanding why change might be proposed from a safety perspective so you can comment or not but i really i do appreciate that part of this work and I, I will note for uh, Chair and Council President Bender, I, I will note within that we, we do list our four lane undivided streets um, and have a specific action around those because we, uh, we do see a lot of crashes on those streets and we know why, um, because they're just complicated and there's a lot of left turns and turning, managing that and without turn lanes is, or, or dedicated signals is, is challenging. Uh, and, and so we are being intentional about addressing those. We've already been making progress. Um, you know, we're, we've been working with the county around Broadway uh, Northeast, um, and we'll be, you know, they'll be implementing a four to three lane conversion on much of that coming up. And, and so uh, that work is safety driven and working with community. Um, I will note that, uh, and we're also working with the county on a study right now of Franklin Avenue. Um, and the four lane section there and a little beyond where we see a lot of crashes. Um, and 
those streets are still fairly unique. We have other considerations uh, in coordination with the other goals, the transportation action plan around bus lanes and, and other things like that that we want to bring in. And so those corridors, we want to get to uh, really thinking intentionally about those with our partners uh, in the next three years. Uh, and But we do need to address them kind of corridor by corridor as well to work out and think creatively of how, how do we address the real issues that we see out there and those safety issues. So it's going to be a little bit of both, um, I would say, in, in terms of you know, the higher level of view, but also just recognizing that still, you know, that Lindale north of Lake Street is, is fundamentally different than, than Lake Street, is different than, you know, uh, Lindale Avenue in North Minneapolis, and, and so figuring out um, how we move quickly um, to address those differences. Very good. Um, Director Hutchinson? Uh, Mr. Chair um, and Vice Chair Bender, I wanted to address uh, two other parts of your question, which is a bit more comprehensive in nature. Um, one, I want to um, assure you and the committee and the, your constituents that we're not waiting to do anything. We're using data to both refine and accelerate what we're doing, but we have not been waiting. Um, and there's multiple ways that we're driving for results, and one way is through our capital program. Every time we redo a street, we redo it with this great complete streets policy that we have. And we do it through our development review processes where we work hand in hand with developers and we're working to get better as that, better at that as the pace of development is increasing. We're doing it through Vision Zero and safety improvements. This is another layer of the work and uh, you asked about the transportation action plan. Um, we'll also be doing it with this more 10-year look over seven different topics that this three-year very targeted action plan will roll up into. So I hope that helps gives just a little bit of context. We hear what you hear. We know that people are really hungry for this. And we hope that by using multiple different strategies, we can both refine and accelerate. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Cano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really appreciative to be here listening to this presentation. Um, I just had two uh, questions. One relates to the expansion of the Hiawatha campus and the relationship to this project. But my first question is, is related to a little bit of what's been discussed here. So I just wanted to get um, real concrete um, clarity on next year's plans then for the Vision Zero work um, does involve infrastructure Improvements. That's kind of what I'm hearing from both Director Hutchinson and and um, some of the things that you've mentioned. Um, so I'm just I'm just curious about the specificity of that because I think some folks are feeling like we're we don't have money for uh, infrastructure improvements that we're just kind of pie in the sky uh, plans, but that there's kind of no no rubber hitting the road here. So um, I'm curious about the the specific things that that you feel we're going to be physically building or improving next year, um, and then connected to that, are we are we communicating well about that? Just just curious because I, I know that I've had um, residents come and meet with me demanding that we expedite the uh, implementation plans for this and that we um, healthily, uh, I guess, uh, you know, resource this work. And so I, I'm not quite sure if we're getting ahead of ourselves or if we're still in the kind of data research planning phase. So if you can help me kind of just walk through that. Sure. So I, um, I'd be remiss maybe not to, given the questions, to share this version of the High Injury Streets Network, which also includes where we've been making or had recent safety improvements that are significant. Um, those are the yellow lines. And then blue lines are where we have forthcoming either a reconstruction project or where we're incorporating safety improvements or some other uh, already planned and programmed safety improvement in 2020 or 2021. And so that's more than a quarter of our high injury streets. We've, so we have been working um, and we continue to, to make that work. Uh, and I think we're looking at, uh, and we get a lot of community requests um, for safety improvements and we, we hear those as well. Um, and our folks in our traffic and parking services division do a really, I think a really great job of considering those um, and making improvements um, uh, 
uh, when they can and responding to that feedback intentionally. We are looking at that process um, and, and ways that we can improve that process. Um, but I want to note that, again, that's work that's happening. So we heard from um, community members in Elliott Park about concerns around safety on 11th Avenue South, as an example, one of our high injury st uh, streets. And this, this year, you know, our traffic department installed a new pedestrian median and other things to, to address the concerns we were hearing from community and allow us to make progress on that high injury street. So we're going to continue to make those while also building out more of the analysis so we can really do a lot more quickly. The lot more quickly is probably realistically happening in 21 and, uh, 2021 and 2022, um, but we're building towards that point where we can really uh, get it out there in a, in a way that we are addressing uh, many, many intersections at one time. And do that in a way that includes engagement on the lead up and strong communications with community members so we're addressing their concerns and they know why we're doing it and how, how to use new things if we do using things that we haven't used as frequently. And then my last question, thank you for that, is um, around the enterprise project of the uh, Hiawatha campus expansion, with um, which I've had the pleasure of working with Director Hutchinson as well as um, Councilmember Fletcher. And um, I do thank him for, for adding this component of the conversation into that um, development project, which is happening in the Ninth Ward. What's the relationship between this, this work that you're leading and that project? Is there some easy overlaps, or do we need to kind of dig down deeper and figure that out? Sure, yeah. And um, I might, uh, Robin, I know, has been very involved in that project. Uh, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Cano, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, per the staff direction that was given to our whole team, I on the Hiawatha campus expansion, the Vision Zero analysis and safety analysis in Hiawatha is on its own timeline and will be accelerated to match the development of that site. We want to be sure that as we're developing it, we've done um, the careful analysis and are able to implement safety improvements while it's happening. So Ethan has actually been involved already and has done a preliminary review of the site, as has Steve Mosing's team, and will continue with that safety analysis um, you know, related to this, of course, but, but it, is, it is on an accelerated timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, thank you for all of uh, your work on this and for the entire team's work on this, this is such an important topic and uh, there is so much here that I'm supportive of and that I really like and that I know my constituents have been asking for loudly and consistently uh, since before I got into office and, uh, and really want to see and we have seen uh, some improvements. Uh, I want to signal though, uh, there's, if I have like a, a sort of big picture uh, frustration sometimes with um, the way we think about traffic and public works is that I think people's experience of the department a lot of times is is raising a concern and being told you're raising it with the wrong person and I, I would say that like you know a lot of times it's like oh no that's a county road oh no that's a state road um, and I'm a little bit worried that we're gonna feel that way about this because Vision Zero has gotten separated from the Transportation Action Plan um, and I, I shared this feedback with you yesterday, so I'm not taking you by surprise. Uh, I, uh, um, I, I want to give you a chance to sort of communicate to us so that we can communicate to our constituents. What I really don't want is our constituents giving feedback on this because they care about our streets and they care about safety and being told, oh, no, that's actually a transportation action plan thing. Um, that's not a Vision Zero thing because I feel like the lines that have been drawn around Vision Zero feel sort of arbitrary um, when you think about our whole big system and all of the improvements that we're trying to make. And so I'm confused um, about uh, what feedback I should be giving where. So I'm hoping you can clear it up for me so that I can clear it up for my constituents. Sure. And Okay, so uh, very good question. Thanks for asking for that. So through the first uh, two phases of engagement for the Transportation Action Plan and the Vision Zero Action Plan, we've been coordinating engagement um, and we've analyzed the feedback that even came through the, the Minneapolis 2040 plan as well that related to traffic safety and other aspects of transportation that inform both of those plans. And so 
I personally have been coordinating uh, the helping to coordinate all of the engagement we've received and make sure that we're considering that across our whole team and everyone working on both plans. And so and we'll be continuing that going forward through this engagement phase. It's really important that people's feedback gets to the, the folks that are working on and it can address that. And so we're gonna be making sure that that happens. And we're actually, I think it's really exciting that we have both of these plans and we're able to coordinate them up to this point. But this, uh, the Vision Zero Action Plan draft was ready and we wanted to, to share that with you all in the public. So, because it's a three year plan and, and we know that people are saying, let's get to work. And so this gives us opportunity to, to get it out there and so we can uh, get it in, in place. The Transportation Action Plan includes many, many other areas. Um, we've got our staff uh, leads on that here. Uh, and there are, you know, we're making sure that the safety components are coordinated in there and we'll continue to do that through this engagement phase uh, to make sure that we are responding to that, that feedback in a way that is, is appropriate. And I also want to note in particular that we also hear from folks frustration about maybe, oh, is it a county road or is it MnDOT road? And that's why we're really intentionally here and recognizing that that partnership is critical for us on Vision Zero. It's also critical for us on the other areas of the Transportation Action Plan and staff at the city are gonna be proactive about that work and helping to figure out solutions across uh, jurisdiction and that will be a true across plan as well. Thank you, I have another question that, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering, I, I mean, this is, this is getting people excited, right? Like putting this out here, I mean, people wanna see things happen and there's a bunch of things that they wanted to see happen. We keep talking about things we can do with paint and bollards and that's exciting, but it, do we even have enough money in the budget for the paint and bollards work that's possible? I mean, it doesn't feel like we have capacity. I've been trying to get just like some signs that help people use the facility we have built properly so that we don't have people constantly parking in bike lanes and whatever. And sure. it doesn't feel like we have, I, I, I keep getting a sort of, we don't have a budget or we don't have somebody whose job it is to look at that right now or who has bandwidth to do that. And um, have we asked for what we need to even do the, the low hanging fruit, the, the bollards and paint stuff? Uh, Chair and Council Member Fletcher, I'm going to pass this over to Director Hutchinson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Fletcher, um, really good questions. We did propose, um, and it will be coming to you in a presentation on September 26, some resources. Um, we also converted some resources last year. This Vision Zero engineer is an effort to, again, accelerate the work. Um, my sense is that we could add all the budget in the world and all the staff in the world and because there are, I don't know, someone knows the number of intersections in the city and the number of a thousand lane miles in the city and the intersections in the city, people would still feel like we're not doing it fast enough, there, though there's just so much uh, demand and request. But we've taken some steps within Public Works. Um, there's another a uh, piece that's relevant here and how we're thinking about our right-of-way and how we manage and inspect it. We made a slight structural shift there so that we could accelerate that as well. So that uh, staffing and resources will come together in a number of ways, some based on funding that we got last year, some based on some repurposing of funding towards this effort, and some based on some requests that I will be presenting to you um, on September 26th. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any further questions, comments? Uh, Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did want to lift up one thing that was talked about during the presentation around enforcement. And I've had the chance to follow the conversation nationally about Vision Zero and talk to a number of folks in other cities who've taken this on um, before we did. And that gives us the opportunity for, to learn from other cities um, experiences and I, I know that in a lot of cities where enforcement was a big component of Vision Zero work that there was um, both real and perceived frustration in the community around enforcement's impacts on people of color and seeing a racial disparity in traffic stops in many of our cities including Minneapolis already um, having a policy that's trying to make people feel safer and more welcome in their community actually having the opposite effect of exacerbating racial disparity and traffic stops. And I think the work that we've done here is important. Um, part of why I think we took so like, took 18 months and or a couple years to, to, to do this was both because of the data-driven approach to, um, to our traffic 
fatalities and why they're happening and all those things, but also because we knew that other cities have really experienced a big backlash to this initiative because of traffic enforcement. And so I, I wanted to highlight that because I know it was captured in the materials. Um, but as we think about how to best implement our policy and the kind of four key strategies here, knowing that it's going to take some time to change state law to get the kind of enforcement that we want through automated cameras, um, which has been so successful in other cities, kind of what does that interim look like and making sure that we're applying the same data-driven approach that we did to traffic fatalities and traffic crashes and, and um, how they're distributed across the city to any kind of enforcement that we would undertake and that it's done in a coordinated way. Hopefully that it would be, you know, coordinated with the map of crashes and the crap of, crash of um, population concentration of crashes and the, the traffic fatalities or done in a way that reinforces, you know, safety improvements that we've made. Um, I'm concerned about the amount of budget that could potentially go to enforcement versus other um, improvements and safety improvements, um, although I know a lot of that is built into our capital program, and so the capital side may be more sort of large than the Vision Zero piece as it is. But I just wanted to make that comment and make sure that we did acknowledge the um, concern that we've heard both from our community here, but also the experience that we've seen in other cities around the balance that we have to strike around enforcement. I think that's noted. Yes. <laughs> Um, any other comments, Councilmember Fletcher? To follow up on that, I, th I think it is worth asking the question because we, we're doing so much in a data-driven approach. Um, and so it is a fairly significant investment to get three traffic enforcement officers uh, added to MPD for that purpose. And that, you know, we're talking about three people working four by 10 shifts. so. At any given moment in the city, there's probably going to be either one or zero traffic enforcement officers in the city, you know, from that plan at, at, across our 24-7 city. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, do you have data from other cities or a sense of what kind of improvement in behavior, what kind of safety improvement a single enforcement officer produces relative to, because I feel like, I mean, if, if we're talking about half a million dollars a year, like a couple of new traffic signals at dangerous intersections might produce more safety. And I guess I'm trying to figure out how, how to weigh that. So in, in terms of a data-driven approach to this, do you have a sense of um, what effect a single traffic enforcement officer has? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair and Councilmember Fletcher uh, for the question. Uh, I will say for a you know an individual you know hundred thousand dollars here versus a hundred thousand dollars there, um, you know there isn't an analysis that's going to give you the the whole picture. What we knew we do know from research um, is that uh, that well designed traffic enforcement efforts can improve safety. Um, we know from uh, from research that automated traffic enforcement is is going to do that maybe the most effectively. Um, if well implemented. Uh, and we know that other investments can also improve the traffic safety and we tried to put together that piece. And then fundamentally we know that picking one over here and not one, uh, you know, an education and communications pieces connected to it isn't gonna yield us the, the best outcomes. And so I think just like we try to think comprehensively across our entire street network, and how are we addressing those high injury uh, streets kind of collectively and individually? How are we making sure that that coordinated effort allows us to get the, the most return on in collective investment? Um, and so I can't say definitively um, $100,000 here, $100,000 there, but um, we, did, we did look at um, you know, all the research we can and uh, to try to tease out, um, you know, and make sure we're making investments and putting things forward that we do think will improve traffic safety and address issues that we've heard in, from community feedback. Mr. Chair. Mm. Director. Thank you. If I might add to this, Councilmember Fletcher, uh, one very specific example is from our neighbors, St. Paul. St. Paul has a traffic unit. We invited Sergeant Jeremy Ellison to come and talk to our task force about their specific Stop For Me campaign, where they've coupled um, engineering, research assistance from the University of Minnesota, and enforcement, and they saw a pretty dramatic increase in compliance 
um, with those three things together. It can't, we, they, it's not just one thing or another thing, but the, that combination of things, um, uh, they succeeded in increasing by something like 40% the amount of compliance. So that's one example that we know of that we have access to that we can research. And we're actually going to be talking with the University of Minnesota about the work they did there about potentially helping us do that same thing here. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ricardo? Sorry, that was from last time. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Um, seeing none, I'll just uh, thank the department and all its work and then also reinforce that this is a multi department effort. Uh, clearly, Public Works is uh, right in the middle of it and sort of leading, but certainly shoulder to shoulder with the other departments. I mean, they are not just there as window dressing, it seems like they are directly uh, uh, contributing. Uh, in a consistent way that makes it really a multi-department effort and I think that's sort of the key takeaway that it needs to be multi-partnered, it needs to be comprehensive, um, and it needs to be consistently applied. Uh, once we do get to that rubber hits the road moment that Councilman O'Connell and, and other colleagues up here have said the community really has been engaged and now they want to see it and I think that's really awesome. And I will also uh, comment that uh, if anyone has any question about the importance of uh, Vision Zero, what it is. I can't think of a better person than Mr. Folly who uh, brings an informed approach but a real visceral, passionate approach to why it's important. Uh, this presentation uh, certainly was uh, full of data and really gave a great hi highlight of what you're working on. But if anyone thinks that this isn't important after you speak, I just don't know if they're even paying attention. So uh, you bring a certain certain panache to it, and I really appreciate that as well, because I think the community really, when they're engaged on it, they want it, and that demand, I think, can drive budget decisions moving forward. We, they're going to want to see the outcomes, and they're not going to settle for anything less. So I think there's an important circle there that I think we are, we're stimulating as well. So with that, um, we have the uh, item before us and approved as designated as a receiving file uh, of the Vision Zero Action Plan to date. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Dissenting name, that carries, and thank you. Thank you.